think I broke Unlike my fiddle player. Unlike the bonsai, we don't have to pay for this by the inch. <laughs> yes. <laughs> they have a live recording of it. Welcome. We have a great episode to talk about today. Lotus Eaters. This episode is pretty easy to follow. So as you read it, you can tell what's going on, you can understand it. It seems pretty simple. But man, there's a lot going on. And I hope that this will give you some insight into some of the things that are happening and there's a huge breakthrough that happens in this episode which sort of sets the pace for the next few episodes so let's get started with the Lotus Eaters now one little side comment I think that my intro to these videos is a little bit long so I'm gonna work on shortening that okay so hopefully by the next video I'll have a little shorter intro but um, if I do that now this video might not get uploaded for five years so coming soon shorter intro now as we always do let's start by our reference to the Odyssey so in the Odyssey Odysseus is blown off course and they end up on this island uh, where the people lotus flowers now the the crew goes and then Odysseus says to go out among these guys and see if they're uh, hostile or friendly and if we can get supplies just go see what they're all about so he sends some guys out to check them out and they find that the crew uh, the the people of the island are eating these lotus flowers and the the lotus flowers have a narcotic effect so they they fall into a stupor like a opium Odysseus discovers this he finds that the crew that he sent out is in a stupor the other crew members want to get at this stuff because everybody looks so happy and you know you know how it is when they're high they're just sort of slow and dull and dumb and he sees his crew falling into this stupor of the narcotics of the the lotus flowers so not only does it take away their their drive and their desire to to do things and all their motivation but it takes away their desire to go home it's very very important the, the crew loses all desire now, now at first the crew is all this you know demanding of Odysseus get us home get us back to Ithaca now after the consumption of these lotus flowers now they don't care they don't even want to go home Odysseus finds his crew members and he has to literally carry them back to the ship he puts them on his back takes them to the rowboats and they shuttle them back out to the boat um, so he has to physically carry the crew out because they're in this stupor so moving into the Lotus Eater chapter we want to watch for references obviously to narcotics and we want to see the effects that the narcotics have on the populace okay so that's your guiding principle as you go through this chapter now it's about 10 o'clock in the morning and uh, Bloom is walking along Sir John Rogerson's key now a key 
Q-U-A-Y. A key is an area like a, a canal bank. It's an area along a river that's been built up, sort of a sort of a dock. It's like a street that's along the, the waterfront. Again, we want to look for references in this chapter to narcotics, being drugged, being in a stupor, escape from reality, self-medication of pain. Look for all those, all those things. Now, interesting, the chapter starts with Bloom walks soberly. Now, that immediately separates him from the rest of Dublin. This is a very important launch to this chapter and I think also to the rest of the book in my opinion because Bloom walks soberly while the rest of Dublin does not. Now Bloom has his problems and his flaws and his foibles and we're going to talk about some of that stuff but I think it's very important to note that this chapter begins with Bloom walking soberly. This Lotus Eaters, this episode, is really the beginning of Bloom's Odyssey. Up to this point, we've had a lot of background. We know that his wife is having an affair. We know that his daughter is contemplating an affair. We know that Bloom is usurped. We know that the Irish are usurped. We've talked about that stuff. But up to this point, it's been mostly just a description of what's happening. This is where Bloom really begins his own odyssey. This is where he sets out on his own quest to overcome the adversity that, that comes his way and defeat the usurpers. So Bloom's odyssey begins here. Now Joseph Campbell wrote a book called The Hero's Journey and that, that this is about the, the central theme of, of all stories that you have a problem. There's a problem in this society. Something is something is wrong. There is a, a famine, disease. Uh, bad guys have taken over the ranch. Uh, there's some problem. Then you have the hero. The hero is incapable of overcoming all this adversity. He's usually the butt of all the jokes. He's at the bottom of the food chain in the town, the ranch, the the team. He's the underdog, the dark horse. Pay attention to that term, the dark horse. He's always the, the least heroic of all the characters. He sets out on this quest. This is the hero's journey. He goes out to learn something or get the magic or redeem the ring or whatever it may be. If you look at any story, it follows, uh, uh, any sto most stories follow this very plot line. Okay? So we have Bloom, the dark horse, and he must embark on his journey to overcome. And this is really the beginning of it. Now, we know that Bloom is a man in pain. He knows his wife is having an affair. This bothers him a lot. But he doesn't stand up and do anything about it to his, to his shame and maybe to his credit. You have to weigh that and and see. Either he's not strong enough to stand up and take his rightful place, or uh, he's tolerant because of his own inadequacy that he knows. After all, he's not had sex with Molly in 10 years, and Molly has a right to that satisfaction that he's not delivering. So Bloom to an extent acknowledges that and and deals with his own inner pain and overlooks that he's not judging her though he, it pains him he is hurt by it he doesn't act on it he knows that his daughter is on the verge of entering into her own uh, sexual life uh, she's referred to it in the letter that she's got a guy of interest and he thinks, you know, has anything happened? And no, but, well, he's not really sure. But this crosses his mind often in Calypso, and it goes through his mind throughout the book. He thinks of Millie. He is usurped in his society. As you know, we've talked about that. Being a Jewish man, he's a second-class citizen. Bloom is a butt of a lot of jokes. 
he's he's looked down upon by just about everybody and not treated with with much respect he is not only pain but bloom is also he's usurped but he is also emasculated he's because he is um, his wife is having this affair and it's is rather blatant and and people mock him publicly it's, though I don't think everybody's aware of his wife having an affair they did they, they jokes about touching her rubbing up against her how hot she is and how hot he isn't there are references throughout the book that that go that way so Bloom doesn't get the respect but he is emasculated he's impotent not only in the reality but also in the in the eyes of the society Bloom sees decay all around him as he takes this walk you'll notice that the very first thing he sees as he walks soberly the first thing he sees is this boy in a in his little sister and the kids got a bucket of guts and he's outside a butcher shop cleaning these guts and he's got a cigarette in his mouth and Bloom thinks oh should I tell him smoking will stun his growth and then he says no he's you know kids got enough pain the, the why why do that now what is this kid doing well he's he's taking the guts from this butcher shop and he's separating out the intestine cleaning that stuff up because that's what they use for sausage casings and so that's this kid's job is to clean up the guts find anything that's salvageable that they can use in the sausage and then to clean out the intestine parts that he can uh, that they can use at the butcher shop to make sausage pretty pretty nasty job and he's right there out in the sun in the street with the table and a bucket doing it so not fun bloom then fantasizes about the east he thinks about the 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 flowers and the people in the sort of uh, relaxed life they only work six months out of the year and then he thinks about the the uh, reds uh, the Dead Sea and uh, the guys that that's floating reading a book and it's because the weight of the water displaces or the the the, the weight of the body in the water and he can't quite get that right I remember before we talked about Bloom is sort of a he's a self-taught guy who's interested in all kinds of stuff but he doesn't always get the sciencey stuff exactly right but he's into it he knows more than most people that you're gonna meet on the street and in fact they sort of laugh at him as you know oh blooms the know-it-all you ask him uh, you know is it sort of like the old joke about you ask him what time it is he'll tell you how to make a watch because he's interested in things and he likes to dialogue about stuff so he thinks about the the, the east and the and the how wonderful it is and the smell of perfume in the air and then that that fades away like many of his fantasies remember bloom is a guy that is in pain and so he is looking for his narcotic as well as the rest of the society around him is is consuming their narcotics and they fall into a stupor and we'll see examples of that as we go through this episode bloom also has his own fantasies that he thinks about but he dismisses them and as he thinks about the the fantasy of the the East he dismisses that as well he pops in the post office and picks up a letter now he started this kind of flirtatious correspondence he put an ad in the paper asking for a, a typist and he started a flirtation with this woman who responded to the ad now Bloom obviously is not looking for a typist he has no need for a typist this was to set up a assignation to get some correspondence to he's a little perverse Bloom and so this kind of meets his needs so he thought his his wife is having an affair so he thought well I'll do my thing you know so he's he's in this correspondence with Martha 
and he gets a letter from Martha. He picks up the letter at the post office, and he gets a letter from Martha, and you can read the, the short letter in the episode. And she shares some of his perversity. You naughty boy, and I'm going to do this to you, and you, you naughty boy, you mentioned that, and I'm going to do that to you. And, and then she wants to, uh, she thinks about him often, and she thinks she would like to meet with him, and she and he has no idea she says how much she thinks about him and she loves his name Henry Flower his his pseudonym and he contemplates this stuff and then she ends with you know she wants to know what kind of perfume his wife wears and uh, that's you know perfume is one of the narcotics that pervades this whole it's in the air throughout the episode is is the scent of perfume. That's the background on that that letter thing. Now he picks up the letter, reads through it quickly. You notice there's a few typos in there. There's one about that she has world that should be word. That's intentional. She's not that bright. Now she's answering, remember she's answering an ad for a typist and there's a typo in the in the very letter. She's not the brightest bulb in the chandelier. In fact, the only thing she has in common with Bloom is this bit of sort of perversity. And you'll see that Bloom grows bored with this. He is intrigued. He got a letter that satisfies him a bit. That gives him a little, you know, because Molly's having an affair. He's got his thing too. Ha ha ha. But it's not satisfying to him. And it doesn't, it doesn't meet the emotional need. And it's more on that in a bit. And Bloom runs into McCoy. And McCoy is chattering away about the first eat. He talks about the, um, you know, they talk about the concert tour. And uh, McCoy makes the comment, uh, oh, who's getting it up? Which is a reference, of course, to Bloom's inadequacy in his in his marital situation, he doesn't like McCoy much, and he's trying to see past McCoy to, to catch a glimpse of stalking as this woman is getting out of the carriage. And in fact, there's a funny line about stepping aside to, to look past the talking head. He just, it, 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 he really doesn't like McCoy, and he's trying to see this woman's leg as she gets out of the carriage, and right as Right as she steps out, a tram goes by and, and blocks the view. Now, there's some interesting stuff here. One is that we get the idea that Bloom's a little perverse, because everywhere he goes, he's trying to catch a glimpse of leg or stocking or something, look up somebody's skirt. Remember when he went to the butcher shop, he's looking at the woman from behind, and he pays fast and tries to get out the door so he can follow her home. He looks, but he doesn't touch. Again, he's again trying to catch a glimpse, and he even remembers about the recently another time that he was trying to catch a glimpse and somebody caught him looking. So this is a regular thing with him. Bloom's a little, little perverse, and maybe from going a long time. I don't, you know, who knows? He's just a little on the pervert side, but he doesn't act on it, and that's important. It's an it's 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 more of a immaturity. Now, McCoy. This guy, McCoy, I want to I want to compare Bloom's description of McCoy, and he talks about his his ugly face. He says when he when he misses the view of of the woman getting out of the out of the carriage, he says, "Lost it. Curse your lousy pug nose." And he's thinking of McCoy curse your lousy pug nose. Now compare this to when Stephen is in the classroom and he's looking at that dull student that couldn't get his math right and Stephen looks at his ugly face and he's and he's thinking that this is a face that only a mother could love. Stephen is seeing himself in the student and his own ugliness. Bloom sees in McCoy his ugliness. These two characters have a mirrored experience here. 
Bloom sees in McCoy sort of his future self. He's a little seedy, McCoy. Both their wives are singers, okay? And McCoy talks about his wife, too, is getting some singing engagements. And Bloom says that's great. And then he thinks, well, she's really a second-rate singer. She's not, she's no good. And, and McCoy keeps making this comparison between the two of them and their wives. And, and Bloom really doesn't like that. It, it makes him uneasy. McCoy also used to sell advertising. He was a canvasser like Bloom. He has a lot of the same characteristics as Bloom. But as I say, McCoy is, is, he's a seedy version of what Bloom could be. This is sort of a Dickensian look into the future, the, the, the ghost of Christmas future if things don't change. If, if things stay on the current course, Bloom could evolve to a higher person or he could end up falling into the rest of Dublin society and becoming a seedy character like this McCoy guy. They have so much in common today that looking ahead, things don't look real rosy. Okay? Bloom is very uncomfortable around McCoy. Now, when Bloom tells McCoy about the concert tour that Molly is going on, what does McCoy say? Who's getting it up? Now, obviously, there's a reference there. Who's getting it up? Well, it's not Bloom. It's Boylan. And Bloom has to tell him, oh, Blaze is Boylan. You, you can fare that one out for yourself. And when, and when McCoy walks away, Bloom contemplates him. He really doesn't like him. And he, first of all, he wonders if he's not maybe a little homosexual. And, and Bloom thinks he's, you know, he's inclined that way. Which he means as a, it's a derogatory thing. He just doesn't like this guy. And, and then he says, he remembers that McCoy saying, my wife and yours. And, and Bloom doesn't see Molly on the same level as McCoy's wife. He sees her vastly above. And he, he thinks, you know, no, my wife and yours, that's nonsense. They're not, they're not the same. She's nowhere near as talented. And then he thinks, geez, I, I wonder, is he pimping her? You know, he's, he just really has dirty, ugly thoughts about this McCoy guy. That I think this is a very important thing because this gives us a uh, Dickensian foreshadow. It's it's like the way things could be but don't have to be. Remember in in the Christmas Carol when when the question is asked, is this the way things are or the way they might be? And the ghost says, well, it's not it's not happened yet. It's the future, right? And I think Bloom has a bit of a feeling about that. Now, throughout this episode, we want to look for references to narcotics and the, and the drugs or the narcotic effect that the society of Dublin is under, okay? And man, this, there's some brilliant stuff. First, we have the kids that are in the, they're in the stupor and the kid's got the cigarette hanging out of his mouth as he cleans the guts, right? Then we have references to drinking and alcohol. We have the reference to the cigar, the cooling effect. A narcotic, Bloom thinks. Gambling. He, there's a lot of references to this horse race. And Bloom tries to get rid of the newspaper. Throw away. Throw away. And there's a horse in the race. Throw away. More on that in a second. Sex is a is an escape. Okay, Bloom has this correspondence going on and he thinks about pleasuring himself in the bath. You know, he's going to have a bath later before the funeral and he thinks, hmm, water on water, mix business with pleasure. So he's contemplating that escape and he's got this 
letter as his escape. There are references to perfume all throughout the chapter. He goes to the chemist and he talks about the drugs and the smell of drugs and the smell that's in the chemist. And obviously people come there for various treatments of things and self-medication. Bloom pops into a church and he talks about the, the Latin mass and how that has a stupefying effect. The, the chanting and the whole he says that the, the, the guys in Rome really have it together. Everything's organized to a T. He talks about the music in the Mass, that that, that has a, a soothing effect, and that brings you in another narcotic reference. He talks about the communion and how that having the communion brings everybody into one big family, and that has an effect as well. That that it makes everybody happy. He calls it the, the lollipop. Take the lollipop and everybody feels good. Another reference to uh, narcotic. So they're all throughout the chapter references to these narcotics which I think Joyce handles brilliantly. All of these things dull the senses and they're all references to self-medication. And the point of this is that the whole Dublin society is self-medicating against pain, usurpation, decline, helplessness. There's all these narcotics available to dull the senses to these things. Now let's focus on Bloom. Bloom is a man in pain. We know that. We know his wife is having an affair. We know he's usurped. We know he mourns the loss of his son. He thinks about the death of his father. The anniversary of that death is coming up, and he's going to the the village to, you know, visit the grave and to do a memorial thing. That's coming soon. In fact, he won't be going on tour with Molly. She will be going with Blazes Boylan, and he's painfully aware of that. And he's going to visit the grave of his father on the anniversary of his father's death. He thinks about his daughter and her blossoming into sexuality. He's got a lot of pain and he thinks about his own impotence against all this stuff. Okay? Bloom has yet to face these things. He has a lot of pain, but he has pushed it aside. He's, he hasn't faced these problems yet. His conquest, his hero's journey, is only beginning, but it begins, I believe, in this episode. Now, here's why. Bloom sees these narcotics. He mentions them. He talks about them, and he gets it, okay? He knows that the people in church are stupefied. He understands that the communion makes them feel part of a family. He understands that the church music has an effect on people. He gets that the, the whole Latin church service is coordinated by the guys in Rome to have that very effect over people. He understands that the, the kid smoking is doing it as his own drug. He understands that people drink to cover their pain. He gets this stuff and Bloom sees a society in pain. He sees it. Okay, where Stephen is poetically spouting off, Bloom gets it. Bloom sees the pain. Now, even though Bloom is this compassionate guy, he still is a bit perverse and he's immature. He hasn't slain his own demons yet. But he makes his first sword fight, his first swipe at it in this episode. He thinks about meeting with Martha. Should he hook up with her? Should he meet with her? And he decides no. In my opinion, this right there is Bloom's first step out and his first step as the hero. He makes his first conscious decision 
no, he's not going to meet with Martha. I think that's a very, very important decision. Now, Bloom is impotent against his usurpers and against those who are dominating in his life. And there are many references to being impotent and being gelded. If we look at the chapter, there's a reference to the horse that's gelded. He mentions the uh, castrati in the choir that they used to use uh, in, the, in the choirs in the church service, and he wonders about what they sound like. And, and Bloom himself is in a form of castration in that he, he can't perform with Molly and he substitutes with this kind of silly correspondence with Martha. Look for references to this castration. There's a, there's a great line in there about a home without potted meat incomplete. That's an ad. Potted meat is just canned meat, sort of a spam. A home without potted meat incomplete. Another reference to castration. But Bloom has made the decision that he's not going to meet with Martha. He's not going to go through with this. If you look at the chapter as Bloom thinks about Martha, little pieces of the letter pop into his mind, but his mind wanders quickly. He thinks of a phrase and then he quickly goes on to something else. When he thinks about Molly, he thinks about Molly caringly, affectionately, warmly. He thinks about her in very different terms. And we can see inside the inner person is shifting. There's a change going on inside Bloom. Pay attention to that. If, if you've already read the chapter, go back and reread it based on this little video really important how he views Molly compared to Martha. And when he buys the, the lotion at the chemist for Molly, look at how he thinks about her, her skin and how nice it is and how nice she smells and her dark eyes. He really has the attraction for her, but he's impotent to act on it but a change has begun. Now, I said that this chapter represents his first conquest, and I believe very strongly that that first conquest is Bloom's decision not to meet with Martha. He's not going any further with this. In fact, he's bored with her. And he's beginning to see that Molly is something much greater than Martha could represent. But Bloom has some demons to slay and he has some things to overcome. So I would say that he makes that first big conscious decision in this episode. No, he's not going to meet with Martha. What he's going to do is buy that bar of soap and go to the bath. And as far as mixing business with pleasure, that's that's not going to happen either. And it doesn't happen because he can't just yet. It's, he's still impotent. But it doesn't happen because he doesn't try to make it happen either. His mind doesn't go there. In fact, there's, a, there's an interesting line about the... Um, uh, the, 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 he, he looks at his body in the water and he sees the, the, the languid father of thousands, the, the, the languid flower floating in the water. You know, he sees his own impotent body. He sees it. I would say that this bath is the baptism that, that our hero is preparing himself to go out and really get serious about slaying the demons in his life and 
overcoming. This is the beginning of that right here in the bath. Even though it expresses his impotence, the bath, the lemon soapiness, the cleansing, the baptism, he is ready now to go out and overcome. I'd love your comments. I hope you'll put some comments below. I hope you'll subscribe so we can get through the whole series. Encourage me to finish. Thank you for watching. I'd love to hear from you. Thanks.